for going. Um, so my name is Abra Kelson. I'm the program director here uh, for Northwest Medical Specialties Cancer Support Community. And we are honored to be an affiliate of Cancer Support Community so we can bring free supportive programs to people affected by cancer um, right here in our community. So uh, very excited for tonight's presentation on um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and small lymphocytic lymphoma. Um, and we will have Dr. McCrossey, which Eunice will be um, introducing for us. So as we get started, um, let's see if I can, there we go. Uh, so just to go over some disclosures for tonight. So this program was developed by Cancer Support Community. Um, and uh, CSC has uh, the final control of the content of the programs. Um, but Dr. McCroskey did have an opportunity to review and approve these slides for us tonight. Um, so just so that everyone's aware, full disclosure. Um, and the slides were also reviewed by um, Dr. Paolo Kami um, back in May of 2020 as well. So I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping tips as we get started. So we've muted everyone upon entry, um, and we just ask that you keep yourself muted so we can all hear Dr. McCroskey and the information that he's going to share with us tonight. We've allotted time at the end of the presentation that we will answer questions, but feel free to use the chat box as, as he's talking. If questions are coming up, you can use the chat box and we'll make sure that we answer those um, as we get to the end here. Another trick that you might use is in your viewing options, you have the option to select speaker view. And we recommend using this view, as you can see, focus in on um, the speaker as well as the slides and get the best viewing um, option there. And then we will make all of these slides and the recording tonight available um, to everyone in attendance. And we will be publishing them on the Northwest Medical Specialties YouTube page. So without uh, <laughs> delay, I'm going to give it over to Eunice so she can uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. Hi, welcome. My name is Eunice and I am a patient navigator as well as a cancer support community program coordinator. And I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight and to introduce Dr. Mikrowski. But before I introduce him, I did want to let everybody know that we are going to be having a raffle at the end of the presentation. We'll be giving away two $50 gift cards and you must be present to win. So um, I will be running that raffle at the end of the night. So please um, just, you know, hold on for that. So Dr. Mikrowski, I want to give him a really, really warm welcome and thank you for presenting um, for us tonight. He attended um, UW for medical school. He did his residency at the Maine Medical Center and um, all the information are about his fellowship and also all his certification. So um, welcome, Dr. Mikrowski. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay, great. And somebody else is going to help uh control the slides, but I'm Robert McCroskey and uh, I am a medical oncologist and hematologist and have been, since I finished my fellowship uh, uh, back in 1991, I have been in the same practice out, uh, out of Puyallup uh, and um, started out, there were just three medical oncologists when I came and uh, now we're part of a larger practice, which includes uh, Tacoma and several surrounding areas and there are 12 medical oncologists and several mid-level practitioners. It's, uh, and uh, we're, we're actually the biggest private practice uh, oncology group in the state of Washington. And uh, it's a, um, and I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, CLL, uh, SLL uh, have been uh, a big part of my practice ever since uh, starting. And uh, here too, we've seen a lot of a lot of changes and a lot of progress in the uh, management of patients with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma, and um, the um, 
here are going to just might as well just jump in. Uh, there are a lot of slides to go through and uh, we'll move through them, I think, fairly quickly. This, uh, this is not my presentation, but one that was made for me. And, but they did a really nice job. It's very, I think it's easy to understand. It's uh, at a level of, uh, for, for patients without a significant amount of uh, medical background, but you may have uh, specific questions uh, directed regarding your own personal questions regarding uh, CLL, SLL, uh, or you may have some scientific curiosity, and uh, I'll do my best to answer those questions at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> so this is just the overview. We're going to talk about CLL, SLL, uh, the differences between the two, some of the symptoms, how we diagnose it, um, communicating with your healthcare team, treatment options, clinical trials and a bit about living with CLL and SLL. And that part of that is uh, our social um, work team uh, who has, uh, you know, who's been here to help both doctors and primarily patients uh, uh, navigate and, uh, and do their best to uh, live uh, with the disease and uh, get effective therapy. Uh, so moving on. Tips for living in this strange new, uh, let me see here, got too many things, strange new land. Um, doesn't mean that cancer defines you. Uh, you can do, you can, uh, you know, educate yourself, get support, have hope and courage. So what is CLL? Uh, C, it stands for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, it is a cancer, there are, um, cancers that um, begins in the B lymphocytes or B cells. Uh, these are immune cells uh, uh, it, that are manufactured in the bone marrow and circulate between the bone marrow and lymph nodes. Uh, there's two main types of lymphocytes, B, B, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Uh, they're definitely a part of the immune system. They're the basis of the immune system. And the B cells specifically make antibodies, which are there to attack bacteria, viruses, toxins, and uh, cancer itself. Uh, but sometimes these immune cells become cancerous, uh, mutations occur, and when they do, they proliferate, and we see increased numbers. Uh, and if these increased numbers are circulating in the blood, we call that leukemia. If it's primarily causing growth of lymph nodes uh, or masses, uh, uh, more solid masses, uh, we call that lymphoma. Uh, other types of leukemia uh, that are the uh, three other ma main types of leukemia are include acute lymphocytic leukemia, which involves uh, an earlier uh, cell in the development of these B lymphocytes, chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a different type of white blood cell called a, a myelocyte or granulocyte. And this is uh, mature aspects of, of that cell line or acute myeloid leukemia or AML. Uh, which, uh, and the two acute types of leukemias are uh, very aggressive diseases. ALL primary, I mean, is, um, was the first curable type of leukemia uh, when it was occurring primarily in children. It does occur in adults as well as uh, uh, children, uh, as does AML. Those are diseases that need to be treated aggressively from the outset uh, and can uh, become rapidly fatal. Chronic myeloid leukemia also is a disease which um, <clears throat> um, more like CLL tends to be more slower growing uh, and, uh, and people live with that disease for many years. Uh, and uh, we have a variety of treatments for, uh, for all of these diseases. I'll move on. So you'll hear many words to describe cancer and its effect on the body. Um, <clears throat> Anemia, which has to do with low red blood cell count. Chronic, which means it's uh, pre present over a long period of time. Leukemia means that these, there's an increase in uh, cancerous white blood cells circulating in the bloodstream. Lymphocytic, which means a subtype of white blood cell. In this case, it's the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes have produced antibodies 
and marrow, which is the, uh, the central part uh, of the um, bone cavities where these uh, lymphocytes as well as uh, other uh, blood elements are uh, manufactured. What is SLL? Um, small lymphocytic leukemia is cancer that affects the lymphocytes. They really, CLL and SLL are very similar diseases, if not the same. But in CLL, the cells are circulating in the blood and the bone marrow. And in SLL, uh, the cells are predominantly in the lymph nodes. They also can be found in the, uh, in the uh, bone marrow. When we see circulating uh, uh, cells that uh, are uh, clearly of this uh, type, we tend to call it chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL and reserve SLL for patients who have disease, uh, which is exclusively in the lymphocytes. Uh, CLL, uh, as it progresses, often does cause, uh, almost always will cause some enlargement of the lymphocytes. I mean, not of the lymphocytes, but the lymph nodes as well. And the lymph nodes are um, <clears throat> small little manufacturing plants throughout our body. When we think about swollen glands in the neck, those are lymph nodes that are swollen up, uh, but we have lymph nodes throughout the body and they can become enlarged. And when they do, uh, they, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and when they do because of cancer, we call that lymphoma or in the case of CLL, it can be CLL with lymph node involvement. Okay. Um, so CLL typically is thought to be a, a slow-growing malignancy. It can be highly variable. Some patients will present with rapidly progressive disease, extensive lymph node involvement, extensive bone marrow involvement with low blood counts, but the majority present uh, early in the state of the disease where they have just an elevated circulating lymphocyte count and that's picked up by their primary care doctors based on doing uh, routine blood counts and they see that there's an elevation of the white blood cells and of those white blood cells they mark as lymphocytes. Um, of patients who present with CLL, uh, the um, survival is uh, for all comers is uh, many years. Traditionally it used to be stated that the median survival was about 10 years. And considering that this is a disease that affects older individuals, often in their 80s and 90s when they present, that's, uh, that, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, but it is also, um, survival has improved significantly in recent years with improvement in treatments. And about 25% of patients with CLL never require any treatment uh, uh, because it does not cause them any illness and it will not shorten their life. Um, as it says, other people uh, will have CLL that grows more quickly and they need to be, they need to start treatment more quickly to help prevent uh, symptoms and help prolong their life. Uh, most people eventually do need treatment. And as I said, that's about 75% of treatment and that treatment may go and, and typically uh, goes on for many years and it may start and stop or it may be continuous and we'll get into different treatments as we go through this talk. Um, there's no current cure for CLL. Um, potentially, uh, bone marrow transplants from other individuals uh, may be curative for CLL, but uh, that is, uh, uh, we have so many other effective treatments and the side effects for bone marrow transplant are, subst are substantial so that it is rarely done in this disease. CLL is the most common type of leukemia in adults by far. Um, uh, <clears throat> it says it makes up about a quarter of new cases. And that may be true, but so as patients live a long time with CLL, it makes up for far more than a quarter of the patients that any um, oncologist or uh, uh, hematologist oncologist will care for with leukemia. Um, 21,000 new patients per year in the United States. The average age of onset is 71 years, and it's uncommon to be seen before the age of 40. Uh, uh, moving on. Um, 
<clears throat> many people who have chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL do not have any symptoms. Uh, symptoms that, and really, uh, this is a key point because patients who present with CLL, um, we really, for the most part, we uh, recommend initiating treatment when we, those patients are developing symptoms from their disease. And some of the symptoms that are fairly common to CLL uh, can include fatigue, weight loss, drenching night sweats, uh, sometimes fevers, uh, and uh, typically uh, we will see low red blood cell count or platelet count. And even more typically, we will start treatment because they have uh, the development of enlarged lymph nodes and those lymph nodes may cause some degree of discomfort or, um, and uh, that can be a, uh, a reason to start treatment. Um, so as stated here, those symptoms, many of these are not specific for uh, CLL or other leukemias. And so one has to always sort out what is the cause of these symptoms. And moving on. Um, <clears throat> a high level lymphocyte count, a uh, type of white blood cells without other explanation is commonly what leads a doctor to suspect chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Probably most commonly is the uh, source for the diagnosis. Uh, if there are symptoms, one has to look for other causes of those symptoms, especially when those symptoms include anemia or uh, fatigue. Uh, such uh, those, um, because so many other things can cause those, uh, those findings uh, going on. So communication is very important. You need to trust your healthcare team. Um, it's important that you feel respected and listened to. Uh, there are no you know, bad questions. Uh, this disease has many different manifestations and um, and uh, uh, your doctor needs to uh, you know, explain uh, what they're finding and, uh, and why they think, um, what they think about your disease and what are the indications for treatment. Um, so blood cancers are relatively uncommon disease, uh, uncommon and nowadays uh, CLL uh, and other types of leukemia are always treated by a specialist uh, in this disorder, a hematologist, oncologist. Sometimes patients who have a, you know, a very mild form of CLL will be monitored by their primary care doctor. And as long as they're symptom-free and their count, blood counts are uh, stable, then uh, they can be monitored uh, through their primary care and referred back if there's any question of progression. Um, but it says if you have CLL, if you ha are you know, there's thoughts that you have CLL. It's worth seeing somebody who has specialty interest in this disease so that you can get as much information to make sure the, the diagnosis and the management is appropriate. Moving on. My internet's unstable. You guys let me know if there's a problem. Um, <clears throat> so the doctor, doctor's responsibility is to tell you what state your disease is and then uh, talk to you about indications for treatment and options for therapy. Uh, doctor, it's important that the doctor understands what your questions are, what your goals are. You do have more than one option for treatment when it comes time to treatment for CLL. And, um, and, and often uh, those decisions are a joint decision between the doctor and the patient. Um, <clears throat> uh, moving on. Uh, think about your values and goals uh, before and during treatment. Your treatment plan should align with your values and goals. Um, Think about your goals for the following areas, physical health and well-being, family and social relationships, work, school, community involvement, other. So let, let me just give you a little example. Sometimes patients who um, are uh, presenting uh, with this disease, uh, 
uh, they want to take a more aggressive approach at the outset and try to get a deeper remission and be off, be off treatment for a period of time. Uh, other patients uh, want to have minimal side effects and they want to uh, keep their, you know, and, and maintain their health as well as possible for as long as possible. And, uh, and so uh, particularly some older individuals may not want to put up with potential toxic side effects of treatment and take a more gentle treatment approach to, the, uh, to managing their CLL and uh, with hopes that it will not progress and it will have a long and durable response. Whereas other people who have you know, better health at the outset may wanna get a, a deep remission and then be off therapy altogether. And so these are you know, individualized discussions. Fortunately with this disease, uh, we have newer treatments that allow people to really have the best of both. Uh, treatment which is highly effective and is well managed uh, and is highly manageable with minimal side effects. Uh, moving on, getting a second opinion. Well, this is true for almost any cancer that you may have or any you know, uncommon or serious disease that uh, you wanna be uh, comfortable that uh, you have the proper diagnosis, that you've got, you received all the information and uh, that uh, your treatment team, uh, that you have faith in the treatment team that you're seeing. And, uh, and, and we live in a pretty large community where there's access to a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of different um, uh, <clears throat> uh, sources of uh, good cancer care. Uh, it's, and then there's a couple of resources here as far as if you wanna access uh, people who have who are considered experts in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, you can go through Cancer Information Ser uh, Services and Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And uh, I think we'll talk a little bit more about Leuke Leukemia and Lymphoma Society going forward. Questions to prepare for your doctor's visit. And again, this is a general sort of list uh, that uh, are very practical. Um, uh, looking and I'll let you read through this list and I'll look through it too and see if there's anything that deserves special comment. Um, well, everybody wants to know why did I get this disease? And that's a good question. Uh, and, uh, you know, was it uh, lifestyle? Was it genetic? Uh, uh, you need to know what the prognosis is, or, or what, uh, and you, uh, and this disease, you need to know that it's highly variable. You need to know what your treatment options are and what the potential side effects are for variable treatments, so you can help uh, pick the best treatment for you. Um, and then uh, looking at what happens if this treatment that you start on is ineffective or uh, at a later date becomes, um, your cancer becomes resistant to that treatment? Are there second line treatments, third line treatments? What is the sort of typical pattern for this, for the, for your disease state? And then cost, you know, cost is actually um, a important thing. Uh, most uh, people in this country are insured, but many people are underinsured. Uh, and um, there are um, a lot of ancillary costs that can be associated with the treatment of, uh, of CLL. Some of the medications may be oral medications. Those oral medications uh, may not be covered by your Medicare as well as uh, the intravenous uh, options. Fortunately, uh, the you know, through uh, the generosity of, uh, of uh, many private industries, including pharmaceutical companies, uh, there are a lot of supports for patients, financial support uh, for patients so that they can get their uh, treatment that is, um, that is needed. And, uh, and uh, we have like in our practice, uh, we could not practice oncology today without social workers and um, financial navigators to help patients with uh, 
accessing uh, their care and doing so within their budget. Uh, so that's, um, uh, but these are very important things to figure out at the very, at the beginning of uh, your treatment and moving on. Um, And once again, CLL, many patients, I would dare to say most patients don't require treatment right up front. Uh, and they are, they are watched for a period of time. Sometimes that's a few months, sometimes that's several years. Um, we call this approach watchful waiting or active surveillance. Uh, and, <clears throat> and the key to this is that there have been many trials that have looked at uh, you know, and they, these trials go way back, looking at whether or not early intervention for CLL will improve quality of life or length of life. And uh, it has never been shown, at least to now, that, uh, that starting early, at the early onset when patients are without symptoms, uh, that you can either improve their quality of life or their length of life. So it's fair to watch patients. Uh, it's best to watch patients and uh, that watchful waiting is usually uh, starts out with uh, visits every uh, three to six months. And so for some patients after a few years, if their disease is really showing no sign of progression, I will see them on a once a year basis and uh, tell them that uh, if they have any new problems in the interim, see their primary care or call mm -hmm. us and come in and we'll check them out. We check their blood counts, do physical examinations, check their chemistries, uh, blood work, and uh, we can see if there's any sign of CLL uh, progression or if there's anything else that might be causing them not to feel so well. Um, okay, moving along. Again, I kind of went over this already that uh, watch for waiting or active surveillance. Uh, I like the term active surveillance. It sounds like we're being more proactive, but uh, they are. it's a very um, well-proven and effective way to manage patients who are without symptoms from chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, and this says here that, you know, early treatment may lead to uh, resistance uh, for certain drugs. But I don't think that's really so important in CLL. I think more important is that uh, treatment for CLL, the drugs that are used, although generally well tolerated, they may have side effects and it's nice to uh, not uh, <clears throat> expose patients to those side effects when uh, there's not a clear benefit of starting early. Okay, moving on. So what are some reasons to um, start uh, treatment? Well, again, this is getting a little uh, replic you know, uh, <clears throat> repetitive, but enlargement of lymph nodes or spleen. The spleen is like a giant lymph node, which uh, rests uh, just underneath the diaphragm on the uh, left side of the uh, ab abdomen. And uh, if your spleen gets quite enlarged, it may cause some pressure on the stomach and cause uh, loss of appetite. You may feel some pressure in that area. Uh, extreme fatigue can be a, a cause, of, I mean, it can be a side effect of progressive CLL. Fatigue is one of the hardest things to sort out because it's one of the sim most common symptoms for so many uh, disorders. Uh, anemia <clears throat> uh, is an important indication for starting treatment for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But again, one needs to rule out other causes of anemia, iron deficiency, bleeding, etc. Uh, low platelets or thrombocytopenia, that is often a, uh, a side effect of CLL and uh, might be an indication for starting treatment. Unexplained weight loss, fevers, night sweats. Um, so looking at the blood work, look, uh, both the blood counts and the chemistries are important and, and examining the patients and talking to the patients to decide when is the right time to start treatment. Goals of treatment are actually to, uh, you know, knock down the uh, number of cancer cells, the leukemia cells, both in circulation and the, in the lymph nodes, while maintaining a good quality of life. Um, uh, 
uh, <clears throat> CLL that, you know, it's called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And even after treatment, it's a chronic disorder that requires management, just like we manage patients with uh, diabetes or, uh, or, or chronic heart disease, uh, high blood pressure. We manage patients with CLL. The treatment may not be continuous, it may be intermittent, um, and, but the goal of treatment is uh, to help people feel well and as well as um, uh, prevent the disease from progressing and shortening their life. Um, uh, the disease um, almost invariably will come back uh, and uh, treatment uh, may be off and on for many years and CLL truly does have the potential to shorten one's life. Uh, moving ahead. Uh, so in addition to watch and wait, uh, watch and wait is the sort of the first, uh, you know, the first line of management for patients for CLL. Once we decide that we do have to start treatment, what are our tools for treatment? Uh, our treatment tools are primarily medication, systemic therapies. Uh, those therapies include immune therapy, and we have, um, uh, we can talk about specific immune therapy drugs, but in this case, we're talking about drugs which have specific targets on the lymphocytes, um, <clears throat> and they've been around for quite some time. Uh, uh, chemoimmunotherapy, which is a combination of more conventional chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, and targeted therapies. Targeted therapies are, in this case, uh, are predominantly oral medications, which have revolutionized our treatment for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, there are some uh, newer treatments which are, uh, are being actively pursued. CAR T-cell therapy, which is a, a, a therapy which stimulates T-cells specifically towards the, uh, the uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia population. And this is uh, something which is currently available uh, for patients who are progressing after conventional therapies. Um, and it holds great promise for uh, prolonging people's lives again for many years. Um, a treatment regimen or schedule uh, can be a single therapy or a combination of therapies. And usually uh, it, we talk about cycles. Uh, so it's Let's say that a treatment, uh, if it's a uh, given by an infusion that's given uh, on a, for example, on a monthly basis or every three weeks, we would call that one cycle. And a, a course of therapy would be a defined number of cycles. Uh, moving on. Questions to talk to your doctor, uh, you know, uh, these are good questions. What experience do you have in treating patients with CLL? Uh, how is your insurance gonna cover the costs of therapy? Um, where is the therapy going to be administered? Is it gonna have some clinics actually, uh, I mean, most oncology clinics have an infusion center uh, attached to where the doctors are working. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes in, um, in small peripheral or more rural clinics, patients will go to an infusion center, which is at the hospital, and they'll see the doctor in the, in the doctor's office. Um, uh, what sort of resources besides the doctor are there to help support patients and answer questions? Oncology nurses, social workers, financial support individuals, um, uh, other support services, and you can ask the doctor, you know, there's, this is a good time when you're starting out, what, uh, you know, what their expertise is. Uh, so starting treatment depends a lot on um, what the stage of the disease is. How, is this early stage disease? Early stage disease, we're really primarily talking about um, active surveillance, uh, more aggressive, more, advanced disease or aggressive disease that requires treatment. Uh, patient's age and overall health might determine why one treatment is chosen over another. Um, what patient's blood counts are, uh, uh, platelet counts. Sometimes CLL can set up an autoimmune condition 
and we're actually treating the autoimmune condition with uh, suppressive uh, immune suppressive therapy like steroids, uh, and that can be an important part of the treatment. Uh, and sometimes the treatments that we use to treat the CLL also treat the autoimmune condition like rituximab. And so that might guide people to start with that therapy as opposed to a, maybe in one of the new oral targeted therapies. Um, there are some certain genetic mutations and this one mutation, which is TP53, which is also 17P deletion. Uh, the name of the gene, which is mutated is TP53 and it happens to be on chromosome 17. Um, and, and when you see that mutation, there are certain drugs that you know are more highly effective for that mutation than for other patients who do not have that mutation. And that universally must be determined at the outset uh, so that patients can get the best treatment. Um, Symptoms uh, management is important and just using symptoms as a guide to starting treatment. Um, <clears throat> additional molecular testing, which may be done, has prognostic indication, uh, you know, prognostics relevance as far as how patients will be predicted to do uh, with treatment uh, and also will, may help uh, define when to start treatment and what treatments to choose. Um, okay, moving on. Chemoimmunotherapy is a combination of immune therapy um, uh, and chemotherapy. And uh, chemotherapy uh, is something that uh, I think most patients have a sense about because it's used across all types of cancers or most types of cancers. And it has a, uh, ability, these are drugs which are, have the ability to kill cancer cells uh, by, in, by usually blocking their uh, growth and dividing of those cells by interfering with the uh, DNA of those cancer cells. But these, can these chemotherapy drugs typically can have side effects. Those side effects that are very familiar include hair loss. Uh, we can see drop in blood counts. We can see nausea. Um, when we have found in this disease per se, uh, chemotherapy uh, has been a mainstay for treatment for many years. And when we uh, developed immune therapy, it was added to the chemotherapy and showed more effective responses, deeper responses, and more prolonged responses. So that's what they mean by chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, moving on. So here's just the names of some of the drugs, uh, which are common um, treatments for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. These drugs, Fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, or cytoxin, um, and given with an immune therapy called rituximab, FCR regimen, is a longstanding regimen for CLL. It used to be universal for every pa for most patients who presented with aggressive disease who were able to take a strong a stronger therapy. Chlorambucil is an oral medication which has been around for a long time. It may be given in combination with a an immune therapy called obinutuzumab. Uh, and um, <clears throat> chlorambucil by itself is now rarely given um, because it just does not have the effectiveness that some of the newer treatment. And bendamustine, which is a chemotherapy, which is given in combination with immune therapy, rituximab or BR therapy. These are very uh, common uh, examples of chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, go ahead. Targeted therapy. Well, targeted therapy is a um, uh, are therapies which uh, are that interact directly with the uh, <clears throat> with receptors on the leukemia cells and impair their um, their division. Uh, most of these are oral medications. Uh, and uh, the one that we've had the most, the longest experiences is ibrutinib or Imbruvica is the brand name. And uh, that uh, initially as, as what happens is that was initially uh, came as a treatment for patients who had progressed on chemoimmunotherapy or chemotherapy or 
single agent immune therapy. Uh, and then uh, more recently was moved up to frontline therapy. And uh, it may be given by itself or in combination with an immune therapy, but uh, is uh, highly effective and is now probably uh, the, uh, one of the most common agents used for treatment of CLL in frontline therapy, uh, but is also uh, still for patients who've had chemoimmunotherapy and excellent treatment for second line therapy. And this is a, uh, a it, it is pill form uh, and it is given continuously and has a very high <coughs> effectiveness rate of keeping the disease in remission. Acalabrutinib is a, a close relative to abrutinib and uh, is uh, used for patients uh, in, with similar indications and as uh, actively being compared to abrutinib as far as effectiveness and side effects. Adelalisib is a different class of drug as is duvelisib. Um, and these are PI3 kinase inhibitor called drugs as opposed to the, what we call the brutin kinase, um, uh, the uh, brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, BTK for the first two. These, this is another class of drugs which are used primarily uh, in third line, therapy, third line treatments for CLL. Uh, but can uh, offer another remission and prolongation of life. And then venetoclax is a highly potent drug which works by another mechanism, again, an oral medication. And this uh, started out as a salvage therapy late in the course of disease and is now being moved up into first line therapies. And as we talk about all these drugs uh, and we're getting, gaining um, experience and cl active clinical trials, we're all trying to figure out what patients are best suited for which treatments. And because we have all these treatments available and these treatments have different uh, rates of response and different side effects, this is where it comes to the, you know, the art of medicine, uh, treating patients with it, what is the uh, effective treatment and meets those patients' goals. Uh, while being effective and uh, allowing them to maintain a good quality of life. Okay, moving on. Monoclonal antibodies. Um, so these are antibodies which are, currently they are, uh, uh, these are they, are, they are an antibody, but they all are identical to one another and they have a specific target. They are given by an infusion. And these are the examples that uh, we have available, three drugs, which are all used in CLL. Going on. Stem cell transplant. This treatment is not commonly used in treating CLL because we have so many good and effective treatments and people do so well for many years. Um, when it is used, it's usually used in younger patients because stem cell transplants from another individual uh, can be highly toxic, including uh, a significant risk of death uh, from side effects of the transplant. And uh, so you need patients who have otherwise good health and can tolerate that treatment. And uh, it's usually used only in those younger patients who have resistant forms of CLL. And so this is what we call allogeneic transplant when it's from another individual. And go ahead in clinical trials. So clinical trials, uh, you may be offered a clinical trial if you present with, to your doctor with CLL. Uh, there are clinical trials available in all lines of therapy. First line of therapy means the first treatment that you are offered. Uh, uh, patients who have relapsed after a first line of therapy, there are uh, drugs available and patients in third and fourth lines of therapy. There are currently, there are active drugs which are being developed and, um, and these drugs are in uh, different levels of development. Some are just being treated, just being uh, <clears throat> released in, uh, into trials, into clinical trials for the first time. Others have been studied in many trials and they are being moved up or being given in combination with other treatments, but uh, it is, uh, not unlikely that during your long course of, uh, of um, you know, living with CLL that you may have discussions about opportunities to participate in clinical trials. 
Uh, moving on. Okay. So questions about clinical trials. Um, am I eligible? What's the purpose of the study? What are the benefits and risks? Um, what tests are gonna be involved? Uh, will I know in advance uh, what treatment I am? Is there a placebo arm to the trial or are all the treatment arms active treatments? Uh, how can this uh, study affect my daily life? Are there extra tests, extra imaging studies that are required? If so, who's gonna pay for those studies? Am I going to have to travel for these, you know, as part of this clinical trial? So, um, uh, <clears throat> for example, we have patients who uh, are seen in our clinic, they get a second opinion up at uh, the University of Washington, for example, which is also called the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Uh, and, uh, they may be offered a clinical trial, which is appealing to them, but then they are not understanding that that means that they're going to have to travel to Seattle for all the testing and all the treatment if they're gonna be part of that trial. So knowing exactly where the trial is going to be performed uh, and what it's going to entail uh, is, uh, is very important. Okay, moving on. Be prepared. Um, so this is really, you know, knowing as much as you can about the treatment. When you learn what the drugs are, it certainly helps to do your own research. Um, <clears throat> we have a, in our practice, one of the best things that's come along in recent years is that we set aside a, um, an education session uh, for every new treatment that uh, is being proposed. And so the patients uh, can sit down for an hour, usually with a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, uh, who is not there to, you know, is, is not actually choosing the regimen, but knows a great deal about how the regimen works, what the potential side effects are, giving patients resources that they can refer back to, and, and most importantly, giving them understanding about what side effects how they can be managed, how side effects can be managed, and when to call and who to call. And uh, because you need to have access to your oncology treatment team 24 uh, seven, uh, moving on. Common side effects um, <clears throat> and some of these uh, things, um, how to manage fatigue, uh, remain active, remaining well hydrated, eating a good diet, uh, getting plenty of rest, uh, infections, what infections to watch out for, what are the signs or symptoms of infection, uh, and uh, infections can be, in, you may have an increased risk for infection because of CLL and because of treatments for the CLL. So this is a, a very important uh, uh, part of, of CLL and all cancers. Going on. Talk to your uh, talk to your treatment team about side effects. How common are these side effects? Are they universal? Or are they something that may happen? It's just like any other uh, drug. When you see the advertisements on television for something that's being sold over the counter, and they give you a list of of you know you hear a list of thirty different side effects. It can be quite scary uh, uh, that uh, uh, and why would I want to take that drug? But that's um, you know, sort of a medical legal thing that they that uh, pharmaceutical companies are responsible to tell you all the potential side effects up front, but you need to know that uh, some of these side effects are common, some of them are extremely rare, uh, and um, uh, and that's very helpful to know the difference. Go ahead. So how might these side effects interfere with your life? And there's no bad question or no question that's off the table. Um, is this going to affect my you know, sense of well-being? Is it gonna interfere with my ability to travel, be around my loved ones, friends? Is it going to cause me hair loss or other changes in my appearance? Is it gonna affect my thinking? Uh, is it going to affect my sexual relationships? Uh, is it going to affect the way 
I eat, um, et cetera. Um, moving on. Palliative care. So this is a, a term that's uh, used uh, in uh, all types of medicine. And it has to do with uh, palliative care is how to improve symptoms and make people feel as well as possible. And it not specifically for, doesn't mean sometimes treating a cancer is palliative. You treat the cancer and they feel better. Sometimes palliation is simply to, um, is simply to relieve symptoms from the, from the cancer uh, through other means, might be giving a blood transfusion, might be treating an infection, uh, might be treating nausea, um, uh, might be treating pain, uh, might be emotional support. All those things are examples of palliative care. Hospice care is different from palliative care in that hospice care is a term for patients who are no longer doing active. And for the most part, it's for patients who no longer are doing active cancer treatment or active treatment of whatever the underlying disease state which is causing them to be, feel ill and they are um, and they are and they are focusing just on uh, quality of life with palliative measures uh, moving ahead so palliative care for CLL what are some examples giving vaccinations up front to decrease the risk for uh, infectious complications I think this is something that uh, has been overlooked traditionally, but not so today. Uh, patients with CLL uh, may have an increased risk for shingles, may have a increased risk for pneumonias. And so getting pneumonia vaccines and shingles vaccines up front is very important. Uh, starting on antibiotics early in the setting of an infection, uh, when traditionally we might have waited uh, for a bad productive cough and CLL, your doctor may err on and treat you early with a course of antibiotics. Um, uh, blood transfusions may be necessary on occasion for patients who are anemic, uh, low red blood cell count, and, uh, and are causing them, to cause, causing them to have fatigue or shortness of breath. Uh, sometimes steroids are necessary to combat the overactive immune system. Uh, growth factor support sometimes is needed to help build up the white blood cell count, decrease infection. And radiation therapy is sometimes used to treat an enlarged spleen, enlarged lymph nodes that are causing discomfort. And rarely removing the spleen is important uh, if you have an overactive immune system or refractory spleen enlargement, which is uncomfortable. Okay. Living with CLL, the end of treatment is not the end of your journey. Um, <clears throat> uh, go ahead. So some forms of treatment for CLL are associated with a course of therapy and that course of therapy is limited. This is particularly true for chemoimmunotherapy where patients get chemotherapy plus immune therapy for a number of cycles over a period of you know, four to six months. Uh, their cancer is, goes, is greatly reduced. It's into a, a remission type state. And then they're monitored to see if their cancer comes back. And so this is what this slide is getting at, is to con that patients are gonna be continued to be followed. Uh, patients with CLL may have a slight increased risk for other cancer formation because CLL is a disease state of the, is a cancer of the immune system. Uh, it can, um, Patients have a slight increased risk for skin cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, other types of lymphomas and leukemias. Moving on. Um, it's important once you have uh, a, a diagnosis of this, you know, like this, which is expected to live with you for the rest of your life that you maintain health insurance. You do not have lapse of health insurance and you do things to maintain your health otherwise uh, as well as possible as far as uh, good lifestyle choices uh, going ahead. So challenges of living with cancer, uh, these are common, uh, you know, emotional problems that we all deal with and cancer can make them more intense or more, um, uh, or more common.
So being having access uh, to healthcare professionals and uh, mental health professionals and uh, seeking uh, support through friends, family, um, clergy uh, is all important as far as uh, maintaining a good um, uh, sense of well-being. Um, Okay. Oh, and then just some suggestions of what uh, can be done. And many cancer centers, particularly prior to COVID, had active, uh, uh, you know, uh, exercise classes, yoga classes, uh, and I'm sure that some of these are now being done by Zoom, uh, but they have long been. A, a nice uh, way for patients to feel better, as well as to connect with other individuals uh, who are going through similar uh, experiences. Cancer support groups have also been a longstanding uh, part of uh, patients' options for uh, emotional support for living with cancer. Uh, living with the uncertainty, well, a lot of uncertainty can be relieved by uh, actively getting information um, and uh, dealing with general health uh, and uh, getting support that you need uh, and, uh, and, and doing things that provide you joy. Uh, move ahead. Again, living with uncertainty. Uh, Legal tools, uh, these are things that uh, we all should actually have as we get older, whether, uh, but cancer is often what causes us, pushes us to get these things done. And these are legal tools that, um, that we can uh, get down in writing that tell our family and our doctors exactly how much treatment do we want at the end of our life? Do we want to have life support systems if it ever gets to that point? Uh, durable power of attorney for healthcare is some is uh, getting it in writing. Who will help make decisions for you if you're not able to make decisions for yourself? Um, financial power of attorney who can help guide your uh, finances. Uh, this is also a legal document uh, that uh, is part of any will and uh, is something that can be done at the time of, uh, you know, when you're looking at an illness. Uh, do not resuscitate order. This is something which is, uh, can be laid out in advance and, uh, can, be a, and can be a legal document. Doesn't necessarily have to be um, notarized, but is something that can be signed by the patient and the doctor. And uh, this is something that is uh, directed towards uh, caregivers, including uh, EMS caregivers. Um, go ahead. Hey, we made it to questions and answers. So um, that took longer than I expected and I apologize for that, but um, um, <clears throat> we got through it an hour and uh, it was a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, slide pack or without a slide deck without, you know, getting into a lot of specifics about treatment. Uh, but this is a uh, patient's opportunity now to ask specific questions that they may have uh, regarding anything that uh, was reviewed uh, or anything else that they'd like to talk about. And I was not monitoring the chat box.